you will be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Today we can start a time. We have, we have enough audience. Mm -hmm. Enough people. Mm -hmm. So shall I start or now? It's nine. Oh uh, yes. Good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the second part of the session 2.1 on characterization of the treaty relevant events. Thank you for joining us here today. This is the last day of the SNT conference. Um, while yesterday the presentations uh, showed variety of methods used for the characterization of the events and uh, use of uh, CTBT data, public domain data, and uh, the simulated data as well for a variety of events. Common theme of uh, today's three presentations are the DPRK events. So the first uh, presentation uh, will be delivered by Ping Yin on the seismic spectral ratios between North Korean nuclear tests, implications for their seismic sources. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Seismic Spectral Ratios Between North Korea Nuclear Tests. How I, oh, this one. Um, spectral ratios between a pair of nearby events were used widely for investigations for seismic sources, taking the advantage that complicated past <coughs> effects can be canceled out with, by information about the source sources are retained. The North Korean nuclear tests, uh, the six North Korean nuclear tests provides a unique opportunity to investigate Korean nuclear tests using seismic spectral ratios. For magnitude of the six Korean nuclear tests must, much, is much larger than pre previous Korean nuclear tests. And uh, uh, good quality data for this test and uh, uh, other four previous nuclear tests is available uh, and the separation between the explosions is, uh, this is, is less than one kilometer, one kilometer according to the accurate relative location results. We use both teleseismic and regional data uh, for this study. Uh, this is a, a result of, of observation. Uh, it, obvious differences observed between regional and teleseismic spectral ratios for P wave spectral ratios of the six nucle uh, Korean nuclear test to uh, nu uh, nuclear test, uh, tests uh, conducted uh, between 2009 and 2016. Uh, the teleseismic observations exhibit a unique notch at about 2.5 hertz, which manifests the little p, big p wave effect of the six nuclear tests. Uh, in contrast, the p wave effect doesn't manifest itself on regional observations, as the 2.5 hertz notch is absent. Uh, additionally, we also computed uh, mm, uh, LG wave spectral ratios, and we found that the network average the LG wave spectral ratios is similar to that of regional P wave uh, in both shape and amplitude, but with the source corner fre frequencies reduced sig significantly. Uh, this phenomenon is consistent with the phase conjecture. Uh, we tried to uh, model the observed spectral ratios use classical theories, uh, uh, theories about the explosion sources. And as a first water approximation, teleseismic P wave of underground explosions can be viewed as the sum of the downgoing P wave and the apparent little p, big P wave. Under this ex uh, approximation, the spectral ratio between a pair of nearby underground explosions is a product 
of the short spectral ratio and the ratio related to P wave reflection. If the, ref, uh, if the reflection of the little p big p wave is elastic, uh, for example, uh, if the explosion is heavily overburied, the little p big p minus p time difference will be simply related to the depth of bury of underground explosions. However, for common underground explosions, the reflection of the uh, little p big p wave involves complicated nonlinear process, and the apparent uh, DOB estimated from the uh, PP delay time would be much larger than the true DOB. Uh, however, we also, uh, we, so in, in this case, we define the apparent uh, uh, DOB as this. In addition, the uh, PP wave reflection co uh, coefficient would be significantly less than that by elastic theory and would be frequency dependent, as well as maybe event dependent. Uh, we used uh, four kind of different uh, underground nuclear uh, 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 source models, uh, four different kind of source models for underground nuclear explosions for the study. Uh, this uh, 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 includes the uh, model by Mil Morphe in 1971 and the Danny Jones model in 1991 and the two hybrids between them. And the differences between these models is shown in this slide. Uh, we can show that the, the PV wave effect on the explosions uh, in this slide if a pair of explosions have different uh, uh, PP time differences, fluctuation due to the indifference between the uh, little p big p and p wave will appear in the resultant spectral ratio. And the amplitude of, of the fluctuation depends upon the value of the PP wave uh, reflection co coefficient. And the frequency of the first spectral ratio notch is the inverse of the uh, apparent PP time difference of the larger explosion if the spectral ratio is for the larger to the smaller one. Um, however, uh, as no PV wave effect upon regional P wave spectral ratio is observed among the Korean nuclear tests, we assume uh, the reflection coefficient is zero in this situation, and the observed network average the spectral ratio of the regional P wave approximately equal to the respective source spectral ratio for a given pair of explosions. For this reason, we may use a source model, uh, the independent measure to model the observed teleseismic spectral ratios. Uh, this slide uh, shows the, um, result, uh, the result observed, uh, obtained, uh, if we assume that the uh, uh, reflective, uh, re reflection coefficient of the, uh, of the uh, case are completely independent. We can see that uh, the uh, uh, PP uh, delay time for, for the fourth and the fifth uh, uh, nuclear test can be well constrained uh, as well as uh, the reflection coefficient uh, of the and the, uh, and the six uh, test. Uh, however, in this case, the PP wave parameters for the second nuclear test cannot be uh, tightly constrained. Uh, for this reason, we tried uh, another, uh, another two uh, assumptions. Uh, uh, one is, uh, the, the assumption two is uh, that uh, the reflection coefficient for the the second to uh, fifth nuclear test are the same. And the assumption three is that what co reflection coefficients for the nuclear test are the same. And uh, we find that the uh, PP wave the time delay is uh, consistent in all the cases. Uh, this uh, is the result uh, uh, obtained. The observed notch, first is the observed notch on teleseismic P wave spectral ratio may be well modeled with indifference between P and apparent 
uh, these are PB key waves of the explosions. And the uh, uh, apparent uh, PP time delay for the six nuclear tests is approximately 0 0.4 seconds, uh, according to the 2.5 hertz notch. Uh, and the apparent PP time delay for the second to fifth nuclear test are between 0 0.2 to 0.3 seconds, with the PP wave reflection coefficient close to that for an elastic PP wave. Uh, however, the apparent PP wave reflection coefficient for the six nuclear test is significantly smaller than that for previous Korean nuclear tests. Uh, and the estimated PP wave parameters for the second to sixth to fifth nuclear tests are consistent with a common view that the Korean nuclear tests preceding the six, the, the 2017 were overburied, causing little degree of surface rock spoliation or late-time rock damaging. Finally, we, uh, uh, make, we make a, a theoretical modeling of the regional P-wave spectral ratios. Uh, as the absolute yield and the DOBs of the explosions cannot be uniquely determined, we att attempted to determine uh, the yield of the uh, of all the five explosions as well as the uh, DOBs of the um, four nuclear tests uh, be between 2009 and 2016 as functions of the uh, six nuclear tests uh, DOB H0, H0 <laughs> sorry, by minimizing the total misfit for different values of it. Uh, this, this slide shows a, a how well we can uh, fit the observed uh, regional uh, P wave spectral ratios. Uh, and uh, this, this, uh, here the, is, uh, is for the, uh, we, we, are, we are shown that the uh, DOB of the, uh, of the six nuclear tests is 800 meters, uh, but uh, for different uh, uh, but if we assume different uh, DOB of the six, uh, uh, for the six uh, nuclear tests, it will give the identical results. Uh, the first uh, uh, modeling result is about the yield of North Korean nuclear tests, as it, as it is show, shown here. Uh, yield estimations increase, increase with uh, uh, the DOB of the six nuclear tests, and for the uh, uh, DOB in the range of 600 uh, to 1,000 uh, 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 meters. Yield it estimations by the Minmofe uh, 71 related models are approximately 100 to 300 kilotons for the six, three to seven kilotons for the second, six to seven, uh, 15 kilotons for the third and the fourth and the 10 to 25 kilotons for the fifth nuclear test. And the yield estimations by, uh, by the Donnie Jones model are significantly smaller than that by the uh, MM71 related models. And the yield estimations by the uh, MM71 related models are basically consistent with that by body wave magnitude. Uh, here we assume the uh, body, wave, uh, body uh, uh, wave magnitude and the yield relationship by Morphe in 1996, where yield estimations by the Danny Jones model are much smaller. And the second modeling result is that is about the uh, DOBs of the Korean nuclear test. Besides the yield of the explosions, we have also up obtained the DOB estimations for the second to fifth uh, Korean nuclear test as functions of that of the sixth Korean nuclear test. And uh, we find that uh, the DOB estimations for the earlier four tests are always significantly smaller than that uh, of the sixth. Uh, we have checked uh, this result and we found that the a, a solution is long travel. Uh, uh, for example, 
if we assume the DOB of the six nuclear tests is 800 meters, uh, uh, then the optimal uh, value for the, uh, for the second uh, nuclear test is, uh, uh, okay. Uh, it is 45, 45, 40, 50 meters. Uh, but if, uh, if the result uh, is too small or too, too large, the high frequency absent will not, uh, will not be well fit, uh, modeled. Uh, this is, uh, under the, uh, we, we find that the LG wave spectral ratios can also be well modeled using the same yield and DOB estimations for P wave but with corresponding source corner frequencies reduced by the near source sh uh, shear to comparison of velocity ratio. Uh, so that's my pr presentation. For Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one short question. If Thank you very much. If there is none, we can continue with the second presentation. The, this is, uh, the title is the 2017 North Korean nuclear test, a comprehensive multi-technology analysis, and will be delivered by Peter Gebler. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you all for coming on a Friday morning. Um, my name is Peter, I'm from the German NDC in Hannover, um, Federal Institute of Geosciences, Natural Resources, and I'm going to talk about the 2017 North Korean nuclear test. Um, this work was done with a lot of colleagues, mainly from the BGR in Hannover, but also from um, colleagues from the GFZ in Potsdam, the German Research um, Institute, and the uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Techno Technology. Um, as you all know, the six nuclear test um, conducted by North Korea is only already nearly two years ago. Um, it takes an outstanding role, of course, in the sequence of North Korean nuclear explosions. Um, several different agencies estimated body wave magnitudes well above 6.0, um, and this estimation translates into a yield estimation of several hundred kilotons TNT equivalent. Um, very strong surface deformations were um, observable during the test and after the test, and also um, quite a lot of tectonic activity was um, observable in, in the aftermath. We have some possible observations of radionuclides that are related to the test, um, which is also kind of a special observation. Our involvement as the German National Data Center is to try to, at least to provide an independent and advanced evaluation of the test. We collaborate with different um, with experts from different federal and scientific institutions, and in this study we apply different methods. So, um, the classical ones are um, seismology, infrasound, and the monitoring of radionuclides, as well as atmospheric transport modeling. But we also um, utilize national technical means, in this case, um, remote sensing data um, or data from non-IMS station, mainly seismological data. So let's come to the seismology part. First, we have to figure out where the test was. Um, we get a, or do a relative hypercenter localization um, based on the cross-correlation of seismograms. So we get a relative location of the six tests that is shown on the right-hand side. You can see it here. Um, all these, or the last five tests, are all located in an area within a radius of 500 meters. Only the first test is around two kilometers to the east here. Um, to achieve this, we calculate the relative locations of the tests to each other, and then using data from remote sensing, INSAR data, um, we fixed the location to the um, known location of the January 2016 test. We have a relatively low error of around 100 meters, and here you can find the location that we estimate for the, for the last test, and we also come up with a depth of around 1.1 kilometers using this method. Um, we estimate the method, uh, the depth also using another method, um, it's called depth phase modeling. Um, we use high frequency depth phases, so PP, so at the surface reflected P waves that are recorded in teleseismic distances at four um, relatively small aperture arrays. Um, we generate the beam forms to enhance the signal to noise ratio, then calculate the synthetics and compare it um, with the observed data uh, for different depths. 
And as you can see here, this is the residual. On the left side is a, a very low residual. And you can see we come up with a depth between around 400 and 800 meters. Um, a side product of this estimation or this method is that we can estimate a, a moment magnitude that is in the order of 5.5 .5 to around 6. Um, Mount Mantap has a very steep topology. Um, and we try to look what the influence of topography is um, on the propagation of seismic waves and also on the generation of seismic waves. We use a 2D synthetic um, wave field simulation um, with a pseudo-spectral approach. We consider an eight kilometer long east-west profile across Mount Mantap that is shown, let's go back, shown here. This is the profile that we use. Um, and take into account the geology to the best of our knowledge, of course. You can see the models here. This is a f on the left side here, it's a very, just a flat, to no, no topography. Here we take into account topography and in this side topography and erosion. Um, you can see here, we record the energy in a little box just beneath the source and look at the outgoing P wave. Of course, energy for all the three models is the same here, but if you look at reflected surface or at surface reflected waves, little p, big p, and p and s, you can see that with topography, you get an increase in the amplitude of those reflected waves. And this might have an influence on the generation of infrasound, on yield estimation as well, because at this high distances, p and PP might be superimposed at the um, receiver in this frequency range, and we might estimate a too high body wave magnitude. It also has an, an influence on the non-isotropic moment tensor component. And we come to the moment tensor inversion that we did. We use low frequency amplitude spectra, that are always shown here on the bottom part, um, with stations up to 200,000 kilometers away, and we use the full displacement waveforms that can be seen here. Um, um, distances up to 600 kilometers away for the stations. And we just assume a layered half-space model after Fort et al. in 2010. You can see the comparisons. Um, red is the, uh, the model, I think, and gray is the observed data for uh, the waveforms and the spectral comparisons here. We come up with a moment tensor decomposition, and then we, est we estimate an isotropic part of around 60%, double couple part of 24%, and a CLVD component of 16%. Um, this is comparable to plenty of other studies. Um, they found around you know, similar results, I would say. Moment magnitude we estimate here, a little bit more reliable, I guess, is 5.5. Um, clearly shows it's an explosive source. No one doubts that, I guess. But, and here we see that um, these are all the models that we calculate, and the little blue square here indicates the best fitting model, um, which has these um, parameters. But more or less all of the, the models that show a good fit, let's go away. Um, are in the, in the range of a very high isotropic component. Um, we also estimate the yield, or try to estimate the yield. To be consistent um, with our estimations, we always use the same 15 IMS stations for the first until the sixth test, but just for consistency. And we come up with a body wave magnitude of the test of 6.2. Right. Um, if we use a magnitude yield relation by Bowers et al, 2001, we come up with a yield of around 400 kilotons TNT equivalent. This is shown here on this side here, if you assume this wet, hard rock conditions. So this was the seismology part. Let's quickly jump to the infrasound observations. The strong test generated infrasound that was recordable at um, the Russian station I-45, around 400 kilometers away. Um, two wave fronts could be observed. This top part here shows the beam. So the first one is the IS-2, so the, in the stratospheric reflected or bent um, propagation path here. And the second one is IT, is in the troposphere um, guided path. They arrive at around 1,456 seconds, this one here, and 1,500 seconds. Um, we have a, also a little bit, it's hard to see in the beam, but here, and in the PMCC analysis, you can see it better, an infrasonic forerunner around 100 seconds beforehand. Um, all these backouts simulated here, they are color-coded and um, point to the direction of the test site, around 210 to 225 degrees. Um, so in temporal as well as spatial, I think we can associate these signals from infrasound to the, to the test itself. So just one slide for infrasound. And now the remote sensing results um, as a national technical mean. First the results from the, from the differential INSA investigations. We use data from the ALOS-2 um, satellite, just a few days before the test and after the test, September 12th. 
um, we measure the coherence values between those images. We get um, values from 0 0.6 for the investigated area as an average value. And in areas where you have visible surface deformation, so in the red part here and the blue part, you get coherence values between 0 0.2 and 0 0.8. You might wonder in the middle there is no values given. Our coherence is completely lost here because surface deformation was just too high to, to measure it with this kind of technique. You need other satellite um, based methods to estimate adherence. So deformations are much higher than here, than in the um, western and eastern part. Um, you have around 10 centimeters of subsidence in the east, this is the blue ones here, and around 10 centimeters of, sub, um, of, of uplift in the western part. Um, from remote sensing data from the Pleiades satellite, we can do a multispectral optical data analysis and can detect changes. Um, all these little purple dots here indicate that there was some kind of landslide that was activated during the test or right after the test or longer time after the test. You can see here they're mostly concentrated around the test site here. As a fourth technology, we use um, radionuclide monitoring and atmospheric transport modeling. Now let's first uh, look at September 2017. On the left side here, you can see the forward simulations. We assume an immediate release at the test site on the 3rd of September at around 3 um, o'clock UTC. Um, we see with the propagation conditions that were present at the moment, the station, not here, RN58 would have been affected by the plume and the station RN38 would have missed the plume. Um, unfortunately, RN58 delivered no data at that time. There were some samples found um, from national measurements, definitely in South Korean measurements at the station Geogen. Um, I think five samples were detected. And if you do an additive overlay of these samples with elevated radio xenon concentrations, um, you can point to a source region, the most likely source region. And in this case, the most likely source region is not the test site for these samples, but the Yongbyong nuclear test facility here. Now let's do the same for October. On the left side here, the forward simulations. Um, we assume and release October 4th, so around one month after the test. We once again see RN38 would have been missed by the plume. RN58 would have um, seen higher or elevated concentrations of um, radioisotopes. Um, and then we go to the, to the backward simulations. Actually, mid of, in mid of um, October, some samples could be found at the Russian station, RN58. And if we once again do an additive overlay of the, of the source regions for the elevated um, xenon-133 concentrations, we get a most likely sort area that's, that's around here. And we can see that the test site is in this likely source region. There's, of course, no definite um, proof, but it, it's a hint that the samples or the, these elevated concentrations might come from here. Sorry. Come from here. Good. Some quick conclusions now. We can see there's a clear explosive character of the 2017 test confirmed by our MTI analysis as well by plenty others now. Um, we estimate a yield of around 400 kilotons. Um, this should be considered an upper limit. We are always a little bit in the, the upper range. We can see strong surface activity, strong surface deformations during the test immediately and in the aftermath. We have tectonic activity, um, a lot of aftershocks up magnit to magnitudes of three. I think some days ago or a week ago there was one nearly 2.8 magnitude earthquake in the test site. Um, we could measure infrasound signals at station I-45 and we could not measure any immediate um, when there were no immediate measurements of radionuclides in September, um, but there are some indications of a delayed leakage of radionuclides from the test site in October. The yield estimate we do when we compare it to um, is still compatible with a, with a fission device only and does not require a fusion device, we would say, because this was the announced thing at the beginning. We have some or had some contributions here. If you want to look at something in more detail, you can look at one of those four posters. I, I uploaded the PDFs of them, I hope, um, for the seismologic part, the infrasound part, the ATM, radionuclide part, and the remote sensing part. Or you can also look at the paper that was published beginning of this year. It's in EGU, Solid Earth, it's open access, and everybody can download. I have some copies with me as well. If you want some, just let me know. And with that, I conclude, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions? 
Yes. Hi, sir. Uh, so my question is, what's the difference between the hard map you used and the loan map someone used? Sorry, once again, please. Uh, what's the difference between the hard map you used in your PPT uh, and the loan map someone used? Else, someone else used. Yes, you, yes. You mean this yes. one? Yes, yes. This is the Hudson map. This is the Hudson diagram. Yes. Uh, but as I know, someone used a loan map. Loan map. How does the loan? Loan. 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 Ah, with the um. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what's what's the difference? What I mean, do you? This see? is just. This shows if the the solution is in the top part. This is a positive isotropic. This is indicates an explosion, and if you go down here, this would more or less implicate an implosion. This is just the components of the, of the sensor that are shown in this diagram here. If you go here, the high CLVD and the negative CLVD, and here we have a dipole and a, oh, this is the double couple component on this axis here. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Maybe one more question? Just a different way of, of projecting, I guess. Yes, on the big side. Hello, I was just wondering how um, confident are you with your yield estimate and whether you have any uncertainties on no. that one? Yeah, we are not, we are confident that we can say, sorry for wrong direction. That, so we try to be consistent by using always the same stations, but of course we do assumptions on this magnitude yield relation. It's very hard to find very reliable sources for that. So we, we just rely on this relation and then um, related tests to each other. I know we are in the upper range. If we have look at other yield estimations, they're most, most of the time a little bit lower, but this is the estimation we come up, but I think we should consider this as, as, as an upper limit. So we're not 100% sure, of course, but we can say that the, the yield increases definitely. This is, can be seen. I mean, nobody argues with that, I guess. Um, so we just try to be consistent, and, but we cannot, of course, promise that that's the right yield, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So we can move now to the last presentation of our session, and uh, the title is uh, UK and DC analysis of IMS radionuclide events uh, near North Korea, and will be presented by Matthew Goodwin. Good morning, thank you. Um, my name is Matt Goodwin. I work at the UK NDC, uh, based at AWE in the, in the UK. Um, this uh, talk is about the development of our uh, radio nuclide analysis capability. And um, this is together with my colleagues, Rich and Ashley, um, who, who are around as well. So um, I'll just go through the, the work that we've been doing to develop our radio nuclide analysis um, for the IMS data. Um, and then uh, looking at the sensitivity of JPX38, particularly with uh, regards to uh, North Korea. Um, so just a quick background on AWE. We have the UK CTBT radionuclide laboratory, the GBL15, and for that we do um, gamma spectrometry of air filters and also beta gamma spectrometry of uh, radio xenon um, uh, samples collected on the IMS. Um, and as well as this, we operate the UK National Data Center and GBL15 scientists work on the, on the radionuclide analysis for this. So I'm going to focus uh, mostly on radio xenon um, as uh, our sort of most likely uh, signature of a, uh, a nuclear weapons test in the, the radionuclide domain. Um, there's lots to consider and ideally if you can get four isotopes um, out then you can uh, plot those on the four isotope plot and discriminate quite nicely between what type of event uh, may have occurred. Unfortunately, it's not always the case, and we're not always going to get all of these radionuclides to get this perfect data. Um, so I'm going to look at some more realistic scenarios as well. So the IMS, we're taking the data every morning and processing, processing it automatically. Um, there are only three of us that work on the radionuclide analysis, so it's important for us that we develop a, a series of automated um, procedures to, to run through all of these. So our automated analysis is um, all entirely um, developed in-house, uh, custom code, 
and um, it's nice and modular so we can uh, switch things out um, as, as we please. We've got different analysis streams which obviously analyze all of the different types of data that we can get from the IMS as well. So I'll quickly give you an overview of those. Um, on the left hand side you can see our radio nuclide pipeline. Um, we're downloading the data using the NMS client and process all of this and we push each of those down a different analysis stream depending on the type of data. Uh, for example, um, particulate analysis, we have the um, camera developed universal software development kit which allows us to use Genie but entirely in Python code so we can develop our own logic and algorithms um, entirely in Python code and apply those automatically to the um, particulate data. This all um, gets archived and um, processed and put in one big database and we can then apply our meta-analysis to those to search for events or categorize data, uh, data um, as we see fit afterwards. Um, in parallel to this, we also have the um, ATM pipeline. So we are processing, uh, we're downloading uh, uh, meteorological data and simulating forward runs from um, possible or known sources of radio xenon um, around the world. And then we bring all this together and look at the contributions to each IMS station and try and work out if we've got an event that we're interested in. And then, based on this, we will then try and hook up with our uh, colleagues in Black Nest, who run the UK Waveform NDC, um, and see if we can tie this with some uh, seismological data as well. So the ATM pipeline, um, I'm not an ATM person myself, but I've put the, the, the values that we're using in here, and uh, I won't go through these, but we're running four simulations each day from um, a, a variety of places ar around the world, and as I said, looking at the contributions to, to each station. So looking at the region around North Korea, there are um, quite a lot of sites that will affect the radios and on background, um, and particularly with regards to JPX 38, we have uh, local sources um, in Japan, as well as um, uh, medical isotope production facilities in China, as well as um, the Yongbyon um, research facility in North Korea, uh, quite closely located to the test site. So how are we trying to sort of understand this picture um, in terms of JPX 38's detections? Um, these are the list, this is the list of uh, emitters that we're currently using. Um, the list was compiled from an IEA uh, published paper, um, but we can expand on this as we see fit as well. So we're using all of these sites, forward modeling, and as I said, looking at the contributions to the station, and there are a number of these which affect JPX 38 regularly. So this is just a very quick study that we did to work out what might be affecting JPX 38 on a regular basis. So we took all of these emitters that we're using um, every day and did a, a batch simulation. So we ran uh, repeated simulations. Now JPX 38 is a sauna system. It's on a 12 hour collection clock from seven till seven, um, which means that we can then assess for every possible collection period over the last several years, um, how many times we had detections at, uh, at that site. Uh, so these are the sites that we're particularly interested in with regards to JPX 38. Um, the local emitters, um, we've looked past for this study, um, so I'll just show you the results for the um, medical isotope production facilities and sites of interest um, for us. So this is if we run multiple emissions from all of these sites of interest and then look at the average concentration that we get at JPX 38 for any given collection period. And you can see the top two plots are for the, um, the two sites, uh, medical asset production facilities in China. So we took the average, uh, the yearly um, uh, emission as a um, worked out the, the, the daily rate, if you like, and then looked at the likelihood of that giving a detection at JPX 38. And it's... You know, we get a, a fair number of detections from, from CAR, but HFETR, which is the one further to the, to the west, as you might expect, actually gives us next to no contributions. From Yongbyon, if we emit 1e to the 10 becquerels, we actually find that we, we got no detections at JPX 38 in this, in this uh, data set. So uh, that was quite interesting for us, is when we were backtracking models, we were finding uh, that it, it looks like a lot of these uh, detections could be from the North Korean region. So just going back in time to 2018, there was a number of detections at JPX. 
and um, we, we, we took these ransom backward models and looked at possible source locations, and one of the possible source locations is from uh, the North Korean area. So we said, well, if this is true, um, forward simulate those emissions and try to calculate a source term. And we came up with this average source term of probably around 4 e to the 11 becquerels um, in, in any given emission. And if we then put this back into our, or adjust our histograms to say, well, would that explain some detections at JPX 38? Well, it would. We would get a, a fair number of detections over those few years uh, from Yongbyon. We can compare all of these emitters and decide which ones are most likely to be contributing at any, any given time. But this is important that this is very circumstantial and this isn't based on any knowledge of the actual release profiles or times. So we're just using this information to build up a better picture of what we are seeing at JPX um, and where that's coming from. So when we're looking for events at, uh, in an IMS station uh, in terms of radionuclide uh, analysis, we are developing automated logic algorithms to, to, to search through the IMS data and, and tell us what we're interested in. We just don't have the time or the, the people to go through every single data point. So it turns out it's quite difficult to identify a, an event that you're interested in. It's, um, we call it the needle in a haystack. Um, but it's a really important part of this whole verification <coughs> process because how we interpret these radionuclide uh, data points really does determine uh, what, what happens from them on. For example, one, one problem that we're having uh, on, on the IMS uh, radionuclide side is uh, detections that are most likely false positives. Uh, CLX-19 is a remote station and it regularly detects Xenon-135, um, a very short-lived radionuclide and therefore very unlikely that this is real. So we have to factor these in when we're, we're, we're searching for events. So what are we looking for? Well, the usual stuff. What have we detected? How much was there? What are the relative quantities of those things? What do we expect at the station? Hence why we're doing these studies to, to try and understand that. Can we correlate these things with, with particular um, detections as well? Possibly this is something we're looking into. So in terms of events at JPX 38, if you take all of the detections above the critical limit, um, so um, not necessarily quantifiable, but these are all detections and you get some sort of median around 0.2 uh, millibeck per meter cubed. Um, and you might think, well, we're only interested in events that occur right further over to the, to the right hand side with a several millibeck per meter cube, but this isn't always necessarily the case. We find that actually the, event, the events we're more interested in are the ones that are hidden, um, hidden very much in there. So this is if you plot all of the uh, quantifiable results. These are the ones that are above MDC for the station. Um, you find that each event that we're going to look at in a second is, is well and truly hidden in this uh, uh, sort of background level at JPX. So here's a number of events that are automatic um, search is picked up, and I'll just quickly run through a couple of those to show you the sorts of things that, that we do with, uh, with this data. So at the start of this year, end of January, there was a clean detection of Xenon 133, um, three consecutive detections, and our forward simulation said that, well, it, it could possibly for, be from North Korea. So the two pipelines fusing together and saying, well, you, you might be interested in this. This is the data. Um, you can see it's just Xenon 133, um, which is you know, pretty much um, just outside as an outlier. So it's a, a little bit higher than what, what we would expect for the background, um, which is good. Um, so this is something we're interested in. Uh, and we can look at the, the simulations that are coming from the ATM pipeline. These are just the two that I, I chose to, to show you today. That's the test site and the Yongbyon facility. And you can see that, well, it's quite difficult to work out which one it might be. So you can compare those uh, contributions with the actual data and see if, if that helps as well. So this is what we have here. This is uh, the Yongbyon emission contributing to JPX 38 uh, with an emission of e to the 11 becquerels. It doesn't agree perfectly. In fact, it doesn't agree at all with the first data point, but that's not what we're looking for uh, in developing this. We're looking for a tag. We're looking to be able to tell us when are we sensitive to each poss possible uh, source? Um, so this is something that we need to work on and possibly go back and then try and constrain the ATM profile, the emission profile to the exact radionuclide data. This is the equivalent for the North Korean test site. So this is if you emit three to 11 uh, becquerels of xenon 133 
on that date at that time, you'll get something which could possibly explain the detections uh, of this site. Of course, we know there probably wasn't a, a, a test at this time, so it's unlikely, but it's important to consider this, especially when people are looking at this RN data, looking at possible source regions, and it says North Korea. Well, you need to consider um, lots of other things as well before you, before you say that that's definite. So a few conclusions from this work. Um, hopefully this highlights some of the difficulties in event analysis for um, IMS radionuclide detections. Um, but there are a number of events that are of significant interest to NDCs, and some of these are possibly from uh, North Korea. Um, we're using ATM and radionuclide uh, science to help, you know, give a bigger picture of what's going on in the IMS. Um, but, yeah, as I said, it really is quite difficult. And our aim as an NDC is to build a seismo radionuclide ATM automatic data fusion of, to give, you know, the analyst the best possible chance of working out what's, uh, um, what's going on on an event-by-event -event basis. So just going back to our pipeline and what we're trying to do, how can we improve our event analysis? Some, some ideas, these are the things we're talking about and hopefully going to be implementing. Um, maybe we need to be, um, we, we need full-time ATM modelers to be um, constraining the emissions to these events. Um, virtual source locations was something that came out of a fruitful discussion with um, scientists at the uh, Swedish NDC. So looking at um, well, what, what if there are other locations that we're not considering. Automatic flagging of these things, event categorization, um, maybe embracing new, new technologies as well. Ensemble analysis was something that's been discussed in literature, so maybe we can combine some of our ATM simulations uh, in this way to better fit the radionuclide data. Um, yep, there are a few posts up, or were up, um, over the last few days, so you're welcome to come and talk to us at one of those as well. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time maybe for one question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So concerning the uh, indications of uh, radio xenons at JPX 38 that you described for recent years, um, indications indeed of radio <laughs> xenons uh, have any bearing on the level of robustness of the data from such stations uh, and particularly with reference to interpretations that have been made in previous years from some reported radio xenon anomalies. Uh, I, I don't know what is the level of uh, uh, anomaly that the community uh, you represent here uh, would, would place most notably in May uh, 2010. We haven't looked at the, um, the, the exact data from May 10, 2010 as part of, as part of this study, um, so I, I can't really comment on those exact ones, I'm afraid. Um, I think in terms of what is classed as a, a, a you know, event of interest for the RN um, uh, detection community, well, it's very, very difficult based on one radionuclide. I think it was mentioned earlier in one of the um, uh, discussions that, you know, if we get several radionuclides and get a ratio, we can do something very interesting with that, but that's not really what we're seeing. So I think maybe one of the uh, outcomes in this uh, answers is that the IMS needs to continue to push forward. We're, we're, we're not where we need to be, really, in terms of radionuclide science, whether that's driving down detection limits, whether that's increasing the density of the network, more needs to be done for NDCs to be able to say, on the radionuclide side at least, that this is an um, event of interest for... Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So we can close the session 2.1 now. Thank you for attending it and following the program immediately after us, uh, session 2.3 starts. Thank you.
good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Paulina and myself will chair this session, uh, last but not least. Um, so the first uh, speaker will be Jeon uh, Etal, uh, analysis result of DPRK nuclear test um, using uh, Korea Meteorological uh, Administration uh, Infrasound Network. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yong Soo Jun. I'm working in the Korea Meteorological Administration. The title of the talk today is Analysis Result of DPR Case Nuclear Tests Using KMA Infrasound Network. Uh, KMA is mostly doing you know, seismic, doing. We are not research organization, but government associations, and dealing with you know, monitoring and analysis and publishing the official data to the public. So mostly doing seismic, but since several years ago, we start to having the infrasound network. So we start to, and today I want to highlight about the infrasound analysis result. Mostly observations, and that the later I will explain about new stations of infrasound stations, then later, about the ray tracing simulation result of forward modeling. Okay, already we, from first test to sixth test, up to 2006 to 2017, we analyzed all this result with the other research you know, agency, and we published this result and analyzed this result to the public. And we, 2017, we just make our KMA and we modify the calculation, you know, equations and uh, something like that. So I will talk about the seismic today because this is already done previously and already present but with me and my colleague before. So, so infrasound analysis result of DPRK test for fifth and sixth tests show very clear signals detect from Korea infrasound station Cholon and Yanggu, and the azimuth detection result exactly pointed out right to the test site, very precisely for fifth and sixth tests. And uh, the fourth test signal is very weak, and I think the wind condition is not favorable, so I think the fifth test, sixth test show much larger peak amplitude, then we have much more nicer observation compared to fourth and fifth. And for six tests, from six tests, we start to using USRISC IS45 for comparison to our result. And it's also perfectly matched with this thing. And observations indicating that we got the signals on the arrivals and the very favorable calculation time with the theoretical you know, calculation result, but the signal is very weak. And for six tests, we have because the six test is the biggest one so far, we get very clear detections and record signals. In the, in the top part on the uh, brown circle is the recorded to the recorded uh, seismic signal, which generate about from the test site about the record about eight kilometers per second. And the later part showing the infrasound record detected at stations and the, and as I explained to you, the azimuth direction is perfectly matched well. In the later part, also in the tail of the window, is uh, after eight minute, you know, explosion, we also monitor the collapse event. And collapse or induced event after a six DPRK test, just right after, you know, explosions, we just record the well. The signal is weak, but we also perfectly match it with the observation using three you know, stations and uh, infrasound signals also recorded well. And that before that, the signals generation, since 2013 and 14, there are a lot of you know, missile tests from DPR case. And uh, I just showing three cartoons or media reports of the 2007 DPRK missile test from uh, launched from Tongchangli site, and the middle one is Shinpo port, and the right panel is indicating Bukchang airfield. These three missile tests launched from west to, of course, launch to the east because they cannot, you know, 
miss our target to the west. The western side is China, so they wouldn't make any problem. So they put, you know, they launch it to the east to say falling to the ocean. So these three events also I mean detected very well. But if I see that the launching signals and they have like in a second, you know, relaunching in the air, so maybe they have in the right side, there was the uh, broke apart. I mean the missiles broke apart in the air. All the signal was recorded well sometimes, but didn't well. But if you see that the, the middle carton of the April 5th, 2017 record indicating very clear signals for to detections. And if you, it is very hard to see here, but the, the azimuth, if you see the azimuth direction for this, the detection family groups is indicating that azimuth detection increase with time, which means the missiles launching from west to east. So we recorded very well for this event. And the ballistic missile signals, which is shown in the right panel, is explode a few minutes after its launch. We detect the launching signals. One panel on the left is launching signals. On the right side, it explode the signals from the air. So we can uh, dissociate with two groups and we detected signals and we can see in the spectrogram result. And uh, if you see the by eye side, we can see there are two different, you know, distinct signals. And the right panel of the right panel showing the uh, spectrograms and showing the launching signal has more lower frequency and the explosive signals has more higher explosion signals. But when I present this result inside uh, our, our department, they said, that how will you verify and will it be 100% sure that the right signal is exploded from the air is really came from the air, then I couldn't answer very rightly. So, and the other, the other thing is what I want to show you is like the first ICBM launch signal from North Korea. It just first day for first tested 2000 July 4th, which is a, a Independence Day of United States. So they launched the ICBM, first ICBM to commemorate this independence of the United States, I think. <laughs> I think they just upload their, this, all this. This is the snapshot for the YouTube. I think they, North Korea just upload, you know, this, this all the process of the, you know, preparing the ICBM launching signals. And after that, we detect many ICBM launching signals and all missile signal, but for example, they restart to launching from the May 2019, and they tested two times a missile, but it is not clear detected that came in for some network for other reason. Yeah, this is first ICBM launching from North Korean signals, but the azimuth detections and the signal coherence is not really well. I think it's maybe the wind condition is not favorable, and maybe I didn't get this, you know, higher profiles of like a top troposphere signals didn't get get through that. So I need modeling for these things in the future. So the main mission of KME Infrasound Network Operation is to detect signals generated from North Korea. Uh, explosion signals and ICBM missile launching signals and nuclear test signals are main target of infrasound wave detection. But uh, for several years, I just monitoring and analyze these things then, but several questions arise. Why detected azimuth of missile signals from DPRKs are imprecise? And why explosion signals? There are min many mining quarry in North Korea. If you see that in the middle part of near the Pyongyang, the, and the south of this, you know, the, their capital, there are a lot of you know, quarry, mining quarry, and they have explosions thousands of times for a I mean, year. So why the explosion signal are weak and hard to detect at our stations? And what do we do need to improve the detection rate, accuracy of the explosion signals, and this kind of question. And do we have to consider more on altitude and or modeling to get the nice trajectory of the launching signals, the ICBM signals? This kind of thing is uh, we have to resolve. I think one problem is our uh, configuration of our two stations is located in the mountain area and those mountain ridge at the altitude from 1300 to 1700 with two stations. And if you see that and network, 
and the subarrays of this configuration is for Chao Wan is like you know three by five kilometers, and if you see the lower Yang station, it's like one by three kilometer. So Azimuth is comp configuration is not identically you know designed to get the signal. So this is our weakness, and so we decide to get new stations, and we just have two. So this year, this month, we recently signed with contract with SeismoWave, build new three infrasound stations. And environment also will support for the tech and the equipment they will so, and they will provide wind noise reduction systems. And this should, this should be done from this end of fiscal year. We will have operate five stations as of 2020, January 1st. And we will use you know, different sensor, MB3A, MB3 sensor of the seismic wave. And all these things we will follow the IMS, you know, CTBT requirement, the guideline for station specification. We will not do the same, you know, mistake that we did before. So, and also not using soccer system instead of the wind noise result system will be used there later. So currently we use some sharp huddles physics, but this time we will use MB3A like, you know, like our IMS stations, mainly now are they the CTBT are using MB3A besides more waves, so mostly doing that, we will follow the trend. And also, we, instead of soft hole systems, we will use wind noise reduction system to get nicer you know, signal reception. Of course, we will meet the CTBT's requirement and the guideline. And this is our infrasound array. Currently, we have, have two stations in the eastern DMZ zone. But this is mainly designed and built it for detect DPRK nuclear test. We successfully detect that. But two, three, about three infrasound array will be installed at the western part of DNZ to fill the gap of monitoring bill blind spot and increase detection rate of infrasound rate. So if you see that it's a zoom three spot is the new station uh, station and they show the array element of configurations. So the actual site is several kilometers by kilometers. We choose the government territory site and we survey with this uh, site with the military Korea agency together. And the next thing is the, because we just mainly focus on the observation this time, what we have to do next time is profit, we have to consider propagation effect and we have to think about the back projection method. So first thing we are doing now is doing infrasound ray tracing simulation from four to six nuclear tests. The calculation for the rate pace of the infrasound wave propagation was done using KMS RDOPS, you know, digital atmospheric models and for proper calculation. And so far the simulation result using the uh, like normal mode simulations or other you know, parabolic equation method, and we test several methods to detect or to get pro adjust propagation process. And so far, we got positive result. And what I'm showing on the bottom is for for test, you know, the simulation numerical resolution result using the KMA wind and temperature profiles and ray tracing method. So we just favorably get this, you know, the proper azimuth direction from test type to Chalwan and Yanggu. Potentially, the, theoretically, we have to 200 and 133 azimuth direction. It's almost identical. And this is the in-person ray tracing simulation for fourth nuclear test. And we have very, very good, you know, focus on the test site. And we, all we have to do is using, because K, KMA is a meteorological administration, we have a lot of you know, atmospheric data and the numerical data with ECMWF, RDAPS, and other modeling data. I'm start to using that and with our colleagues. So, so the bottom is the, the bottom, uh, the 10 bottom, you know, um, cartoon show the RDAPS numerical weather forecast at the test site at the test time of fifth nuclear test. And the C, if you see that from lower upper to the right to the bottoms indicating the uh, profile from lower to higher altitude from three or five to 10 to 20 up to 75 kilometers. If you see the test site, which with the mark with the star, 
they don't have a strong wind blow on that time of the nuclear test. For, so for fifth and sixth test, that's why we have direct observation very clearly. So without any simulation and modeling, we got very nice asymptotic detection successfully. So that's, I think that's why we got good result. Compared with that, four tests, we didn't get good signal because the explosion was smaller compared to fifth and sixth, but I think the wind directions or any other atmospheric condition is not favorable. Oh, and this other wind temperature and density in the plants and the pressure profiles is like a for KMA observation and pressure data. And currently we are doing the direction dependent on the 2D transmission loss calculation result of 50 figure take test. And we still got the preliminary result. We are still modifying the atmospheric models. Conclusions, KMS infrasound station so far successfully detected the arrival of infrasound wave for DPK, DPR case nuclear test and ICBM missile launching signals. But, but a lot of you know, mining explosion signal, local mining explosion signal, which is very low explosion in terms of magnitude is less than 2.0. Uh, and some like ballistic missile launching signals from North Korea did not detect clearly to our network. Maybe energy loss of propagation and station monitoring environment maybe affect that result. And we will ins install three infrasound stations to improve our detection rate and uh, our initial result of atmospheric propagation modeling applied for ray tracing method using KMA data reflect uh, real atmospheric condition of deep air test. And we will next time, maybe next SNT or several years from AGU meeting, I will show the waveform model, source modeling of the explosion, the bias, you know, source modeling things and back projects method to verify and uh, improve our result. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we will entertain one question for the interest of time. One question. If there is any. Oh, thank you. No question. Next. Well, my uh, thanks everyone for coming to this session. I am Chandan Saikiam from the U.S. Air Force. And top thing that I'll be talking today is mainly on the technique and some results. I'll be talking about the reduced displacement potential for the Korean explosions. I'll use a technique called waveform equation technique, which I have been working for quite some time. Topics that I'll be uh, discussing today will be on motivation, then a little bit talk about the method, then I will talk a little bit on how I formulate that reduced displacement potential, particularly the formulation for psi infinity. Then I will talk about the Green's function similarities in the data, regional and far regional distances, and I am going into a topic which will be a little bit tough to explain the whole thing, but I will try. This is little p big P N and P N or little p big P to P interactions, which is connected to depth estimations of the event. Then I'll talk about the illustration of the WEM using numerical seismograms, that is synthetic seismograms, I'll be using FK. And then I'll apply that WEM technique to DPRK explosions using both regional and teleseismic data, then hit on to the conclusions. Motivation is very simple. Generally, when we try to do the depth estimations, we go little p, big p interactions. And it is difficult. It requires model and modeling of data. And also, effect of T star also plays on that because pulse width is important. When events are shallow, little b, big p becomes very close to the P wave. And so, effect of pulse on the pulse width where we try to model it, it becomes difficult. So, I decided I kept on work trying to find a way where I can avoid that. So instead of uh, doing on the actual synthetic modeling, which I always do, I, will try, I try to see if I can make use of those information in the data. 
So we'll be using recorded data at a, along a given path from different explosions. The data will bring in the effect of T-star, topography, and lateral path variation if there is any on a common station. And method is also very simple, very easy to apply. And good thing is that it will eliminate the computation of synthetics. But in terms of showing how method works, I'm going to take advantage of synthetic seismograms. This is the whole method. And it is basically, I had a schematic there for region one and region two. In this particular case, I will say that all my explosions are in a particular uh, region. And if I have two observations, for example, which I call O1 and O2, it is basically a combination of a convolution process of source with the Green's functions. So if I had that observed data, and if I assume a pair of source time functions for the two events, I cross convert all those things and try to subtract the resulting seismograms, there will be a different seismogram, which is this one, the second equation. And if I try to minimize that, if the source time functions that I choose theoretically, if this is exactly at the source, implicitly sitting in there, then this would be minimum, actually we should get a zero trace. And those, for those conditions, my theoretical source time functions should be same as the, what is better in the data. And another big assumption will be there that Green's functions should be similar. These conditions are satisfied when you are looking at the data at large distances, when the depth of the events are not significantly different. So that condition will probably satisfy. But one can argue that topography will play a role Yes, it does play a role, but within the frequency band we'll be looking at our wavelength, probably topography effect on my data will be minimal. And we'll do different kind of minimization. We'll look at variance reduction. We'll look at L1 and L2 norm as a criteria to minimize the particular function. Then source time function, I'm putting the whole thing as is, but I actually want to go to the last equation which I'll be using, which is RDP. And F function is are there, it is already published in my paper. So if you want to take this uh, slide alone, they will be able to program this up. This RDP is not a new concept. It has been used for a long time. Each RDP is related to psi infinity. That psi infinity, again, is related to two parameters. One is B, other is K. B is related to the source depth K is the uh, uh, corner frequency of the event. And this has been used by different authors, as I have mentioned, for Amchitka, Kenikan, all of the explosions in prior studies. And here, what I'm showing, the data recorded at MDJ, one of the stations, very, I like the station for many reasons. And I collected the data for Korean events. I have not plotted the uh, smallest event, that is first event, which is small in size. And I self-normalized all the records and put on top of each other. If you look at that, those traces on the right, on the surface wave part, these wave pumps are quite similar. That is what I'm going to exploit in my analysis. And if you look at the P wave part of it, in the frequency band, because I'm putting as raw data, turning them to displacement, there are a lot of uh, non-similarity, but at certain frequency band, you will see they will also look similar. And this thing I have done at many stations, all over wherever I could get hands on, and this phenomena, the Rayleigh wave, when you normalize, self-normalize, they look similar for all the events. Then here are some of the stations in, we downloaded data from uh, Japanese high frequency network, brought the data in, did the same thing, same thing. On the surface wave record, if you see all are self-normalized though, they sit on top of each other, basically telling me one thing. These events were relative depth were not that much significantly different, and as a result, Green's function from source to the receiver is same for a common part. But in P-wave part, there are many places you will see like example AM, M is second, plan down, second panel down, the first trace. In P wave, there are some mismatch. And this is always the case with the P wave. But surface wave part, wherever you see it, unless the station is toward the ocean side, they have always 
this particular phenomena. I have about 72 stations. I am showing you only a few of them. Now here comes the thing. So in when the surface were the same, I had asked the question, the green functions are same, they're looking same. In that case, if I have the, uh, probably if there is amplitude difference, that amplitude difference should be due to the source. So I uh, computed a lot of synthetics at the different distances. I'm showing for one distance here as a function of depth towards the rightmost trace in the surface of an absolute amplitude as a function of depth. If you look at those seismograms there, they sit on top of each other, especially on the surface wave part. And that means in the data for a particular green functions path, for all the events, their depth not being too much different to each other, their surface waves probably are same. So what I'm going to do, use that particular property on equalization method and see that how well I can pull out the source information. In this side, I am trying to do a P wave. In the regional distance, I am looking at different models. One has got the sharp moho, other has got moho structure, has got gradient. If you look at the initial part of the seismograms on the right side of the P waves, these are all direct P wave going down from the source, and later part is little p big p. In little p big p, contributions are different, but on the P wave part of it, down going, uh, also contributions are same at regional distance. These are observations I need to use in seeing how equalization works. This is the method. I can use it as a two station, two event method, also multiple event approach. That means I will take many events together and do this minimization, or I take two of them together. If I take two of them together, I'll take first two. I'll not put anything. I let depth vary, RDB vary, and find out what are their solutions. Then for second pair, say event two and event three, I'll fix the results from, for EB2, event two, from the first pair calculations, and then try to minimize those functions and establish the source parameters for event three. Then when I go to event three and event four, I will fix the event tree from the previous iteration and then seek for the minimization of these functions. But with two events, there is a problem. And you will see in the later on. So in order to avoid that problem, because it may take you some uh, local minima, solutions to get the minimization. So if you put multiple events, say you will do this technique with three events together or four events together, it will perform better. In, for DPRK, it is easier to apply because there are already six events. If you throw out the first one, we have got five of them. Now, this is a calculations that I have done. I considered four events. I created them. I put them different yield for those. These are theoretical. Then I put them at different depths, then created um, my synthetics. Then I use the equalization of those because I know the source time functions. And I try to find out what kind of solution I get. I'm showing you the solution between three events, one, two, three, or one, two, four, or two, three, four, or four, three, one, or four of them all together. And that is the range I get. Uh, I do the increment of those L as one kiloton, five kiloton, five kiloton, and 10 kiloton, because I'm giving bigger range here, event is bigger. It takes for a long time to compute, complete the whole job. So when you look at the one, two, three, or one, two, or three events, there is a spread in the estimation of my uh, yield of those events. They are close to those number, but they have a spread. But when I go to all four events, I found that it almost comes to the solution that I started with. So more, more the events mirror the whole algorithm. It will work for more events. Today, what I'm going, this is a work in progress. So the result you will not see in great detail of these things, but you will see with two events only. Now, these are the cases where I'm applying to the DPRK data. On each of these things, for N to K, a third event and fourth event, for example, a left-hand side panel is the data. When I plotted data on top of each other on the left side, there is a mismatch. 
But when I went to the equalization method, I found the RDP appropriate for those two events, and that fit is better. It has started fitting the data. The on the other side, right hand side, I am putting NK5 and NK6. Left hand side, there's hardly any fit. On the right hand side, data is fitting fairly well. So equalization is working with two events. Question is, are they right till coming out? As I told you before, on the, based on my synthetic experiment, if I take only two events and do these things, they may not always go to the right solution. But if I would have, which I'm doing now, it's still continuing, if I take more events together, most likely I will come back with the right solution. Here are the P wave part of it. I just pull out the P wave from the equalized seismogram of these events of different stations, MDJ, BRD, SEO, and USA 0B. All this in P wave part also, it, 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 is, it came out by default when I was doing the surface wave. There also equalization produced my waveform on top of each other for different event after equalization. I am doing all the events together to show that even though there is little bit big P interference there, anti waveform, they do seem to uh, satisfy my thing that waveform equalization probably is working. Then here in the Japanese data, it is the same thing, left hand side, actual data plot on right, no, these are equalization. In some of the stations, equalization is not working because of the problem in the PVA part of it. Oh, I, I'll be gone. This is the thing. And these are the results. I'll go up, no, these are the results, basically. Those are the Final thing I'm trying to do, right hand side, those are psi infinity from waveform, and this one from WEM. They're pretty much right numbers within a factor of two. And those waveform is coming from waveform modeling that we always do at FTAC. Then these are the cases where people are doing T star and all those things. This figure here, it shows the plot of two events. Their P waves are on top of each other. They are of different size. So pulse width from here, it is very difficult to assess because we do not know what is the T-star. Calibration of T-star is going to be very important. And that's why I am doing some work out there and see how T-star will work. And in that figure, I put the results from uh, Chavez et al., which came out in 2018, and I used equivalent psi infinity for that function and put our hours, what we got, Waveforms look all the same. So there is a problem of T star when you do teleseismic P wave. So you have to be able to calibrate T star adequately so that you can trust your results which come out in terms of yield. This is our equalization finally. On left hand side, I used all the teleseismic uh, data. Left hand side, I'm using um, psi infinity from paper published by service at all from Santa Cruz, this thornless paper. And on the right hand side, it, are, it is from which is coming out from our work. And I cannot tell apart which solution is better. Because Thornley has got some sort of T-star, which is about 0.78. And I do not know if that T-star is exactly right. I talked to him, he said that there, is, there could be a trade-off. So, in conclusion, what I have shown here, the waveform equalization method is probably is a good method. If you use multiple events together, I would prefer to have four. In case of Korea, it is a perfect place where it will work well. But with new area where it is coming in, will come in, we have to wait for at least two to get started, and three and four probably will do even better. Then when two explosions I am criticizing two using two explosions method. But if I know one of them very exactly about the source parameters, other one will, uh, will come out correctly. So if you can calibrate some of one of them, you'll be able to get the source parameters of the other one using WEM. And those are basically, you can read it up. They are there. 
I'd like to tell you one thing about the source time function that I use. My source time functions I have predicted at elastic radii. I know that that formula that I have developed there is at, should be at the elastic uh, cavity radius. There is a zone between cavity radius to elastic which is nonlinear zone. Right now we are working on that stuff that what is the correction we need to bring the source time function from elastic radii to the cavity radius so that that factor we can add into our corrections. And somehow, if we put it in, hopefully our results will be more to the source, what is happening at the actual source. My next presenter, he is going to talk about that part of it, and you will see how that factor is going to be very important in our work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will have only one question for the interest of time. One question. There, yeah. uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, I say that uh, when you use the regional data, actually use the surface waves. Uh, but in this case, the secondary sources of the explosions cannot be ignored. This is the first comment. And uh, the second point, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as it is illustrated in my presentation, uh, for, uh, uh, for when you use P-Wave, uh, actually, the, uh, the, the P-P-Wave is different. It, it is it case-dependent. Uh, as they, they, if the if the population is present, okay. Yeah, I agree. I'll just let you tell you very briefly. And in case of other source secondary sources, you probably are talking about tectonic release and CLBD, all those stuff. Apart from the other uh, sources, probably spall. I think even if it is there, we know for all these events. Predominant component in the waveform modeling, you have done it, I think, I have seen that. Uh, those are isotropic. And depending on uh, when you decompose your moment and your matrix, isotropic part is significant. So long as isotropic part is significant as opposed to the others, there will be some, some effect, but it will predominantly bring out the result related to the explosion. In terms of the little bit big P, yes. Little B, Big B is really a tough thing, and I was very surprised that it did the way it did in my equalization. And that means what it is telling in a regional wave, little B, Big B contributions come a little later. And if you compute synthetics anywhere you want to do, first pulse of the little uh, P wave is always going to be under ray which dives down, and it will be always depending upon the depth free of little b big b thank, thank you. you very much um, the last talk will be presented by uh, Zedin Etran. and the last one it's worth waiting this time all right thank you very much um, again my name is Sohail Zedin I'm going to talk about uh, the data analysis and simulation of the source physics experiment um, so here are the partial list of the authors. They're all from uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab, Los Alamos, Sandia National Lab, and MSTS. And uh, I need to highlight that there are three other institutions that are involved in the project, FTAC, uh, Nevada um, Research Institute, as well as uh, uh, DITRA for, for phase one. Um, so here's the, out, here's the outline. Uh, this one doesn't work, so. Um, here's the outline, so I will talk about the motivation, the source physics experiment, uh, the SPE modeling framework, thank you very much, uh, and then I will show some results about the near field and the far field observation and simulation, and I will summarize with some application for source discrimination. Um, this is the motivation actually is to uh, understand pretty much discriminate between um, anthropogenic sources such as uh, bolide explosions, um, mining um, uh, work, machinery and earthquake uh, versus nuclear explosion. And so we use um, the shear wave motion, uh, gener wave generation 
as uh, the shear wave as uh, a discriminant uh, uh, to decide whether it's a nuclear versus non-nuclear. And so the NRC, which is the National Research Council in 2012, has um, identified or recommended that the United States should renew sustainable event in the effort <clears throat> to uh, harvest the reward of the source model to enhance underground explosion monitoring. And so for that specific bullets, the need were to understand the shear motion generation, build an end-to-end -end simulation uh, from source to receiver, and understand how the PE to S wave uh, get converted, um, and uh, enhance the discrimination between the sources for monitoring. Uh, moreover, the National Academy of Sciences in 2006 um, decided that the seismology is uh, reaching a new era, and uh, the need actually for HPC computing as well as big data is very important. And so I hope through this talk I'm going to convey that we did uh, um, progress in both uh, these um, uh, points. To look at the source physics experiment, it's worth actually diving into this cartoon. So we have what we call the near field area where the explosion take a place. So there will be uh, uh, cavity formation and so on. There will be either new surface um, for uh, failure surface or tensile failure surface, um, as well as reactivation of existing um, faults. There, there will be also um, uh, generation of these of these um, of these waves that will get um, um, uh, that will interact with the with the, the topography as well as with the texture material, and they get converted from P to S and so on. Um, the goal is really to understand uh, from the far field observation the effect of the source region, the free surface effect, and the path effects. And that will help us actually to assess how much of the energy goes into shear motion versus the other pieces. And the goal is to look at this into two um, media, essentially alluvium and granite. So granite is the SPE phase one, and then the alluvium is the SPE phase two. Here's our, the two campaigns that they were designed actually to answer those questions. These are pretty much the granite uh, shots. So you have uh, uh, six shots, SPE one through six. And then um, the DAG or the SPE phase two is our only four shots, uh, one through three and four. And they are all executed. Actually, the DAG four was executed only last Saturday at 12.06, uh, 2.06. So uh, all of them were successful. We collected the data. And the goal is to create a model that mimics actually both uh, materials and see whether we can reproduce the signals that we have uh, observed. We need to do that uh, through uh, uh, conditions of uncertainty. We will never know all the characteristics of uh, the, the granite in each point of the domain as well as the alluvium. So we decided to look at some uncertainty Essentially, for the granite are the joints and their orientation, their size and their connectivity. Uh, for the alluvium, it's actually the inclusions or the spatial variability of the lenses, their sizes, their connectivity, and so on. So these two will be used as a, an input synthetic um, fractured or porous media in our model in order to recover the signals that we're um, after. Here's how we decomposed actually the the, the model. So, um, since we cannot use one code to do all the all, all the uh, spatial scale, uh, so we decided to deconstruct a, a near field box where we use hydrodynamic codes uh, that capture the shock physics uh, emanating from uh, the source from the source itself, and then we abstract uh, that nonlinear behavior as the elastic uh, box, and we feed it to an elastic code for uh, wave propagations and uh, teleseismic distances. Uh, we do also the same thing from the acoustic point of view, which I'm not going to cover uh, today. Uh, picturally speaking, this is how it, it is done. So as I said, we generate either which domain we are shooting the shot in. We embed it in the geodyne, geodyne L, which are the hydrodynamic codes. We propagate the shock physics uh, all the way to the elastic domain. We abstract that source, and then we feed it into WPP or SW4 to simulate for large distances. I also put some uh, uh, measurements about the size of the boxes as well as the domain and the CPU requirement. Uh, 
this slide is very old, we became more efficient as we've done it many times. To use hydrodynamic codes, you need to um, assess how what we call is equation of state, which means how the material behaves under high strain, high pressures. And so we use what we call the Barrett and Bass 1975 compilation of the correlation for granite as well for alluvium um, of all the nuclear shots that they were conducted before. So initially, if you don't know where to start, the best way to do is to start your, your calibration of the material model to the nuclear shots and see whether you can reproduce what has been observed. Using those equation of states, then we feed them into our model. And so to show you some of the results of our model, I would like to show the layout actually of the near field um, instrumentation for the SPE phase one. So as I said, we have six shots. These are pretty much the, the well where the shots took a place. And these are the instrumentation around the well. And so we made sure that uh, we have accelerometers to measure the radial, tangential, and vertical components um, of the waves at shot depth. We call that the free field to compare it to the Barrett and Bass solution that I showed you previously. So here's an example of the results. So you have here velocity as function of time. Um, so there are three rows. The first row is for uh, well 14-2. 15-1 and 14-1. And then you have the three components, the, the radial component, tangential component, and the vertical component. In each plot, you see the purple curve, which is the observed one. And then the red bold curve is our um, average solution of all the Monte Carlo simulation that we have done. And then the dash red curves are the brackets, actually, of our confidence interval. And for illustration purposes, we put like three realizations just to show you the spatial variability that we observe in the signal. And these are pre-shot um, uh, predictions. So uh, all what we did is we took the signals once we measured the data and we put it on top and uh, actually successfully we did very well. Actually blindly, we could predict actually what's gonna happen. Uh, so we did that for three, four, five, and six, uh, here's uh, five, just to reiterate the same, it's the same format, uh, three different wells, three radial, com uh, three components. And again, uh, pre-shot wise, we did really very well in predicting actually all the signals before we measured them. SP6 is the shallowest one, so there's a strong interaction with the surface as well as we were concerned whether the scaling law that we use uh, would be applicable or not. So we looked at uh, the SP shot uh, versus um, the SP four, five, and six, uh, three, four, five, and five, and actually they behave the same way. So the scale law still applies for the shot uh, because granite is a more competent uh, uh, material, and therefore uh, it still behaved the way we expected. Um, looking at the at the attenuation curve. So how the source physics compare with each other and compare to some legacy data. And we can see that the radial components all align together and the shear components all align also the same uh, line. And the difference between those is uh, we always see there is about 20% of the energy goes to shear motion and 80% goes to the uh, P wave. As I said, there is a strong interaction with the surface. So we try to do some two analysis on this panel. I show um, the analysis of the spall. It's really very hard to simulate. Um, and then on the second panel, it's pretty much the surface expression, which is the deformation after the shock has reached and settled uh, the, the surface. So as you could see here, um, we are showing actually the N, the N wave. So again, because it's a stochastic, uh, the green line is the observed one. The, the A is the average line of all our simulations, and the two other lines are the upper and lower confidence interval in our simulations. Again, we did very well, Blanchett, you know, we recovered actually the signal, and we bracketed with our confidence interval. For uh, the surface expression, once we get the data, actually we looked at uh, our favorite one, which is A14, the closest one to A0. We estimated that there would be an uplift of 40 centimeters, and then the settlement would be about 20 centimeters. Actually, the measured one was 
it was, was roughly the same. So uh, we, we feel really confident that we know what we are doing with the, with the granite material. For the alluvium material, the design of the layout is different. So we have a three legs because we were interested by doing some of the anisotropy analysis. And we have also four rings, about 10 meter, 20 meter, 40 meter, and 80 meters. And they are instrumented um, accordingly to this curve, uh, to this plot. Again, we made sure to have accelerometer as a shot depth. Moreover, we did uh, a 45 degree uh, accelerometers to actually to assess the energy, how much from shot three, the energy going downward versus the one goes upward. Um, so we did characterize this a new site using these 12 wells. Um, so what we got is uh, density, gamma ray, and resistivity, and we did some spatial analysis to see how the spatial variability of, of the alluvium near the shot uh, looks like. And actually, we, we found actually that the shot, uh, uh, the, the region is characterized by uh, isotropy to strong anisotropy, um, depends on the azimuth, as well as depends on the range from the source itself. So, um, and the structure of the correlation varies from spherical to, uh, to fractal-like hierarchy in the structure itself. So to generate uh, random realization and to minimize actually the Monte Carlo simulation, because as, as I said, they're costly, uh, we decided to rewrite the new codes actually on how to generate these random realization using the joint probability distribution to minimize the variability within each field. And so those are used for the subsequent simulation. Before we get there, I, I would like to show you some of the results that we observed in DAG1. So these are DAG1 uh, velocities, meter per second as function of time in milliseconds at the DAG2 shot level and DAG3 shot level. And you have the longitudinal as well as the transversal for each of these uh, four locations. And we, we see like constant delay between the shear motion, uh, shear motion wave arrival versus the P wave arrival. Uh, moreover, we, once we did our calibration to the mean behavior of the paradigm bass, we realized actually when we shut DAG1 that the alluvium was a little bit stronger than what we expected. So we had to recalibrate our equation of state and then predict DAG2 and when we predicted DAC2 and we collected the DAC2 observation, they fall within, uh, within the new equation of state, which helps us to gain confidence in the model itself. We predicted also uh, the peak velocities at the surface as well as uh, the peak accelerations. Uh, and we predicted also the spall uh, region, the extent of it uh, from ground zero. Uh, moving uh, forward to the far field, uh, as I said, so once we create the source, we abstract it, we embed it into this uh, geological framework model, and we can conduct large field um, uh, simulations. Uh, I will present the far field synthetic and observed signal using both the linear uh, array, which are five legs, as you can see there, and the large N array, which is pretty much a carpet of uh, accelerometers layout on the surface. There is a dense region with the 25 meter spacing and there is a less dense region with the um, uh, 50 meter spacing. And there is about a thousand uh, sensor here. Some half of them are three component and half of them are single component. Here's how the progress uh, look like. So initially you got the source, which is right there. You can see actually the wave start propagating. There's the P wave then the P will generate, then there's the S wave. You can see some focusing actually, and then the S turns into RG with the interaction of the surface. So actually this uh, uh, large end not only allows you to look at the propagation of uh, the wave, but also allows you to do cross correlation between these uh, point measurements and determine actually some of the intrinsic properties of the subsurface. Those intrinsic properties actually helped us to determine actually what we call the von Karman parameters. So whether the um, spatial or the scale of the, of the lenses are about uh, one kilometer versus uh, um, 0 0.25 kilometers. And using these correlations, we can generate actually a stochastic 
perturbation in the GMF, which is the geological model. And that allows us actually to compare um, only the geology without stochastic features and the geology with the stochastic feature to what was observed. And that allows us actually to improve and capture the, the high frequency uh, content of the signal. Here's how it looks like the high content, uh, the, the signal uh, in one of these uh, line, one it's here for this series and one is in the basin, which is right there. And as you can see with the GFM, we, we do not bad at all, but actually if you add the, the, the stochastic variability, you do even better. So um, again, the stochastic variability enhanced our predictions. I'll pass this one. And so what we, we are doing now is move from local scales to uh, um, uh, large distances, about uh, 200 kilometers, 500 kilometers or so. So there's the Nevada test site. And Arben Pitaka start doing actually simulation for discrimination purposes between earthquake and explosions. And uh, what he found out actually focusing, defocusing, and focal mechanism can affect the performance of the PS ratio. So Bill Walter has published uh, recently, 2009 BSSA, a paper where he showed actually that the PS uh, ratio may not work for uh, uh, local distances. So we're working on how to improve the network in order to get uh, more of that information. And here's the conclusion, and for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip it. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, we'll entertain only one question. We're out of time. Yes, please. Thank you for your in a presentation. I have uh, actually two questions, and I need to hurry. And one question is that if I remember correctly, you are solving, you are studying from solving the hydrodynamics, and that means I think that uh, you are simulating from the detonation process. And do you do do you compute the interaction between the structure and hydrodynamics in one code, or do you couple those interactions in a different code? There are different codes. So we do the hydrodynamic and uh, we move the waves to elastic domain because the second part is an elastic wave, so it has to be the same physics. And then we take that source box, we put it as in uh, boundary conditions for the second step. And that allowed us actually to, to bridge the, the scales from the small scale to the larger scale. Okay, um, the second question is probably I'm um, quite uh, kind of amateur in this field, but um, in my shallow understanding, solving the uh, acoustic problem is almost equal to solving the elastic problem in some sense. Um, you said that you are also solving the acoustic problem. Um, uh, is there any meaning that solves the wave equation in parallel with the elastic problem? Or do you need to s solve the wave propagation in the another media, like in the atmosphere? Or? Yeah, yeah, so actually, w I did not show anything about the acoustic part, but we do it two ways. Either I get the surface displacement, like I, I showed, and then we feed it to a Rayleigh integral um, method, so uh, with some corrections for the topography, or we take the source, the same carpet of uh, displacement, and we inject it into another code yet that solves actually the the, the elastic wave, wave propagation in the, in the atmosphere. Um, so we do it both ways, but it's a separate piece. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. So um, with this, we conclude uh, this session, our session, the last one. So enjoy your coffee break. Thank you. <laughs>